Hi girls and boys. This is the day two of the read aloud. Um, hopefully you had a chance to go on and read the read aloud from yesterday from our I put 12. Heard from a few of you regarding it, but hope to hear from a lot more of you. Um, so remember yesterday uh, in the reading, the, um, the, the ship had sunk, so there's no more big ship for them. And now they're in the lifeboat waiting to see if anyone's going to come and rescue them. And there are 50 people in that lifeboat, and they have enough um, materials for 15. So let's see what happens. So many arms and so many legs jammed, crammed together. No leaning, no slouching, no room to stretch or twist or turn or lay back, except for Father O'Sullivan, weak with the flu, sprawling in the bottom of the boat. Squashed side by side, elbow to elbow, knee to knee, packed together like our lifeboat rations of sardines in a can, we tried to sleep. A torch, then two. Hey, they are! At last! Our rescue! It's not a ship. It's another lifeboat. They call to us. The waves have come so the boat can pull up alongside. The name's Payne, says their lifeboat captain. We're from the marina, part of the convoy. Where is the convoy? asks Father O'Sullivan. When are they coming for us? Payne glances at Cooper. Cooper clears his throat. <clears throat> Might as well know the truth, Father, he says. No one expected we would be attacked this far out. Our destroyer left last night to help escort another ship. But where are all the other ships? Payne sighs. After a U-boat attack, Naval rules require all convoy ships to scatter to avoid further casualties. The Germans sank the marina, too. But don't worry. I'm sure Captain Nicole radioed an SOS to high command, and a rescue ship is on its way. You seen any other lifeboats? We had two for our crew. We have only found each other. Cooper and Payne agreed to stick together till dawn. I tried to go to sleep. We'll be picked up tomorrow or the day after that. The Royal Navy will save us and we'll go home heroes, right? A wave hits me in the face. Winds rising, white caps, cold spray, storm gray. Morning's light reveals a shocking scene. It's just us and the marina's 16 men for as far as the eye could see. Stone cold seas stretch out north, south, east, and west with nothing between us and the ends of the earth. Where are the other lifeboats? How did we get separated? Did they sink? Is everyone dead? I ask Father O'Sullivan. I don't know, son, he says. Maybe we just drifted faster because our boat was full of water. All we know is this. We and the marina's lifeboat are alone on a vast and empty sea. We have decided to set sail for Ireland, I hear Payne tell Cooper. We should make land in about a week. Would we go too? Officer Cooper looks at us at our overloaded boat. No, safer to wait where the Benares went down. Then the rescue ship can find us. God be with you, calls Father O'Sullivan. And with you, shouts Payne. I watch the other lifeboat go, then turn to my friends. We look each other in the eyes, but no one speaks. We look down, all wondering the same thing. Which captain made the right choice? Captain's orders, all British men back to the stern, all other crewmen and midship, all passengers forward to the bow. Ramjan Buxo translates the orders for his men. Officer Cooper nods to him in gratitude. Slowly, carefully, one by one, we rearrange ourselves so as not to tip or flip or flood the boat. There is none. Hang on, says Stuart Purvis, pulling out a canvas tarp. We can use this. He and signalman, signalman Mayhew fasten it across the bow. Now, two adults or three of you boys can fit underneath the shelter and take turns napping out of the wind. 
Derek puffs inside and sticks his head out. The businessman, Mr. Mr. Nagorski, starts to laugh. He looks like a duck coming out of its hole. From then on, we called the tent Duck's Hole, our tiny hidey hole, away from the glaring sun and the salty spray that stings our cuts. With nothing to do, I count our crew. Six boys, five British sailors, 32 Lascars, one businessman, one priest, and one lady in a lifeboat full of men. 46 souls in 30 feet of timber, shorter than a London bus. Steward George Purvis is busy digging under seats and floorboards, taking inventory of the supplies that our lives depend on. I craned my neck to see what he finds. One sail, rudder, tiller, one set of flares, two axes, one bucket, one small first aid kit, one oil lamp with oil, one box of waterproof matches, one sea anchor, one can of grease. The compass is damaged, Purvis reports. Disastrous news. Now, how will we find land without a compass? We'll have to use the rising and setting sun to gauge east and west and look to the stars to find our true north. I think of my books about adventure at sea, and only then do I realize what else we're missing. A radio, charts, flags, fishing gear. No way to find our food, no way to find our way. We'll make do with what we've got. Purvis digs down into the metal lockers and reports what he finds. Ship biscuits, tins of sardines, salmon, corned beef, pineapple, peaches, condensed milk. After our glorious nine courses and extra cream on the Banera ship, we're back to this. Rations. How much water? asks Miss Cornish. There are two large canisters, says Purvis, about 16 gallons in all. Enough if we portion it out. The sight of the water cans reminds me how thirsty I am already. Can we please have water, I plead? Yes, water, says Derek. Water, the boys all shout. Soon, says Purvis, very soon, but not soon enough. My throat is scratchy and my tongue shriveled. The sounds of salt water lapping, swishing, swirling, teasing, torture me. I dip my hand in the drink, ready to cup some precious drops of water. Stop, orders the captain. Do not drink the seawater. He explains, it will make you thirstier. It will make you mad. It will kill you. I remember a line from one of my books. Water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. I gaze out at the ocean. Salty blue water as far as the eye can see. And only now... Does that line make sense? A rescue ship will come. We know it will. But if it doesn't, in a day, the officers say we will sail for Ireland. Officer Cooper looks at his watch, studies the sun, consults the other officers, calculates the distance to land. I feel the wind blowing. Today, it feels like a friend. The officers are hushed but catching my eye. Cooper smiles at me and gives a thumbs up. He's not giving up hope, so neither will I. The southwesterly wind will keep us moving east, Cooper tells us. Mr. Mis Mr. Nagorski works his way to the stern to talk with the officers. He returns to the bow to confirm that we're about 600 miles from land, about an eight-day sail. It's far, but maybe we can make it if their guess is right. What's the least amount of water we need to survive each day? I see Stuart Purvis count the people aboard, and he's doing the calculations. And he announces, we will each be allowed two small dippers of water a day, one at noon, one at night. That way we'll have enough for about eight days. But I wonder, are we 600 miles from land? Is eight days of water enough? Time to eat, says Steward Purvis, taking charge of our first meal. One hard ship's biscuit the length of my finger, one slice of corned beef on top, and one dipperful of water. 
each bit of food is passed down from the stern, hand by hand, first to us children, then to Buxo's crewmen, and finally to the British staff, until all 46 of us are served. The process takes forever, nearly three quarters of an hour. Then Purvis dips the, su the thumb-sized metal cup into the water tank and sends it down the line. No one is allowed to sip slowly. The little cup must be passed back right away so that others may take a drink. When it's my turn, I see the cup holds just a few mouthfuls of water. I tip it to my lips and then pass the cup back. I hold the water in my mouth for a moment. I roll it over my cheeks and tongue, a cool bath that douses the fire of that devil thirst. Then the water slides down my throat and is gone. Please, just one more drink, Paul begs, no longer shy. It's nay enough, says Billy. Please, George, says Derek with a twinkle in his eye. Georgie Porgy flashes a smile of affection but is firm with our food rations, unmoved by pleas, complaints, glares, or groans. I'm still hungry, still thirsty, but it will have to be enough to last eight days. In eight days, we'll be saved, if their guess is right. All right, so I'm going to stop there for today, and hopefully their guess is right, because if it isn't, they are going to run out of food and water, and that wouldn't be good. So think about, hmm, what do you think? Do you think eight days will be enough? Do you think they'll be rescued in eight days? Give it a thought and maybe uh, enter your idea on um, the journal writing. Uh, and don't forget, um, I need to see what you're doing every day, uh, whether you're doing Khan Academy, reading. You should be doing a little bit of all of that so that I know that you are continuing your learning um, because we have to start taking attendance. And the only way I can tell that you're still learning is that you're doing Khan Academy so I can go on and see what you're doing. If you're doing epic reading, I can see how many books you're reading, how much time you're reading. Um, if you're writing in your journal, I can see that. And then the other sites I can have access to as well to see that you are doing some learning and not just watching video games all day. Um, and you can also, in your journal, um, write down maybe a book you're reading from our school library. Uh, those kinds of things. So as long as I see that you're doing some kind of learning, I can mark you um, that you are basically at school, just learning at home. Okay, so thanks for tuning in and I'll read some more tomorrow. Take care.